Everybody, for you to take your seats if you haven't already. Um, it's great to be together in Banbury this morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Chris. This is Stephanie. Um, it's a privilege to serve you and be leading this morning. It's also great to have Steve and Bev Jones with us this morning from Oxford. Um, Steve's going to be speaking to us later, and Bev has a couple of prophetic words she's going to bring. And it's great to welcome back Nick, who is back from uni this week. So, back to him, give him a good um, Just a few quick notices. There's no youth this morning, but we are doing provision for kids' work. Um, masks are no longer required for singing if you don't want to wear them. You're welcome to, if it would make you feel more comfortable. Um, yeah, we're going to have some time of sun worship, and then Steve is going to speak to us. Um, as we were praying this morning, Nikki had a word about when Moses goes up the mountain and he encounters the presence of God, his, his face is transformed and it's shining with the holiness and glory of God. And there's something in that for us this morning of when we encounter God, when we worship Him, we go away from that change. We go away from that having encountered God and we are transformed into more of his likeness. So that is our prayer for this morning, that we would encounter God and go away looking more like him.
since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. I just, I just want to pray for us, you know, that whatever it is in our hearts that might be slowing us down, might we be able to just chop that stuff away so we can wholeheartedly follow Jesus. Jesus, you're the best. We fix our eyes on you. We love you. We're so thankful for you. We want to run, Jesus. We want to run after you. We want to throw off anything that slows us down, that trips us up, that holds us back, that ties us down, whether that's hurt or disappointment or pain or sin or whatever it is, Jesus. It ain't worth it. We want to follow after you, Jesus. Would you help us? Would you fill us? Would you be with us? Would you reveal whatever we need to throw overboard so that we can follow you, Jesus, wholeheartedly, joyfully, lovingly, brilliantly, filled with your love and your life and your life overflow, Jesus. Amen. Because that's where I'm going to start building them into your 
communities as well. Yeah. Thank you. Kids, this is your cue to go to your feast. Doesn't that sound cool? <laughs> if you follow out that door, Catherine's going to show you where all the food is. speak to us. I'm sure most of you will know who he is. Steve is a senior pastor in Oxford Community Church, but also leads the sphere that we are a part of in Solon Light. Um, and he is going to speak to us this morning on baptism. Okay. <laughs> Both kinds. <laughs> Do you like that picture? There is, there is someone there. There is. And she's, she's, she's quite happy, I think. <laughs> She was happy a few minutes later, a few, se a few seconds later. All right. Great. Right. There we go. Uh, that was the last time I baptised someone, which was last month, which is fun. That was in Africa and uh, in a swimming pool there. Um, you're in a series looking at the vision of Jesus. Yes. 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 Excellent. And this uh, topic for this morning, baptism, is right there in Jesus' vision. Uh, it's clearly very important to Jesus. Uh, it was one of the very last things he spoke about on this earth. It's right there in what we call the Great Commission. Matthew 28 says, and verse 18 says, Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. There's something a little bit odd about this word baptism or as it has it here in, uh, in Matthew 28, baptizing. Something a bit peculiar, it has a peculiar history in that it goes strangely untranslated. Let me explain. There's a word in the Greek that this English translation comes from, the word ethne, which is translated nations, because that's what it means. There's a word pater, which is translated father, because that's what it means. There's a word huios, which is translated son, that's what it means. And uh, hagios pneumatos is the Greek for Holy Spirit. So that gets translated. And then there's this word in the Greek language, baptizo, which is translated, but it's not. It's just sort of somehow carry over into the English language as baptized, which is odd. It's untranslated. Actually, there's a reason why it's untranslated is because it's an embarrassment, its actual meaning is an embarrassment to many Christians. A great many Christians sprinkle babies with water and call it baptism. But the word baptize, baptizo in the Greek language, means to immerse. And I think the best way to make sense of this for Brits is to say like a tea bag. <laughs> You don't sprinkle a tea bag with water. There's not a lot of benefit in that. But you baptize, you immerse the tea bag. That's what we do to make tea. And it was actually the case that in uh, a couple of hundred years ago, as our Bible societies, which are wonderful, wonderful organizations, but as they got going, they refused to fund the publication of English language Bibles that actually translated the word baptize as it really is as the word immerse. So people like William Carey translating the Bible into various languages in the subcontinent of India wanted to translate the word as it just, just wanted to translate the word from Greek into the Bengali, say, equivalent of the word immerse. The Bible Society refused to fund it. They said it was divisive to translate the word as it. So today we use the word baptism, and it's odd because of that history 
So I'm changing my title this morning to Immersion. Just to make the point, really. And I'm going to try, I'm going to try to use the word Immersion all the way through instead of Baptism. But I might fail because it's so wired into us to talk about Baptism. But what it's all about is Immersion. Uh, there are two kinds of Christian immersion, one in water and one in the Spirit. In Acts chapter 8, we read of Philip, who told this Ethiopian on the desert road about the good news about Jesus. And it says, as they travelled along the road, they came to some water. And this Ethiopian eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being immersed? And he gave orders to stop the chariot, and then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip immersed him. This immersion in water has a couple of meanings, but it's most obviously about cleansing, put things into water to get them clean. And this immersion in water, a people in water, speaks about the cleansing that God does to us, not just of the mud. That's on, gets on the outside of us, but cleanses us internally as well. It's wonderful. And because we didn't, we didn't, oh, I've not got the picture there anymore, we didn't leave them in the water, obviously, before we back out. It speaks really clearly of death going into the grave and resurrection coming back up again. Death and resurrection, it's about change from one way of living, death to the old life and rising in a new life in Christ. A really powerful picture, this immersion in water. There's also an immersion in the Spirit. Uh, John the Baptist, or as I want to refer to him, John the Immerser, <laughs> said, I immerse you in water, this is in Mark chapter 1, but one who is mightier is coming. One who is mightier is coming, and he will immerse you in the Spirit. So that's just a wonderful, wonderful phrase to be taken, just like a tea bag is immersed in water, and for us to be immersed in the Holy Spirit, just surrounded by him, overwhelmed by him, given entirely over to him. And at the start of the book of Acts, it records Jesus is saying to the disciples, wait for the gift my Father has promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John immersed in water, but in a few days you will be immersed in the Holy Spirit. Yes. That happened on the day of Pentecost. Now these two kinds of immersion in water and in the Spirit, they are distinct experiences, but they're both part of becoming a Christian, and they can happen in either order. <laughs> we see this in the book of Acts. So if we read Acts chapter 8, about what happened in the city of Samaria, it says that when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria, and when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Just to note, this um, phrase that Jesus uses, that John, the immerser, uses is that the people will be immersed in the Holy Spirit. But elsewhere in the New Testament, the same experience is described in other language. It might be described as receiving the Holy Spirit or being full of the Holy Spirit. But it's the same experience being described. And these believers, it said that uh, they prayed that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been immersed in the name of the Lord Jesus, that is in water, and then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. You don't need to hear that amplified. <laughs> so in that case, they'd already been immersed in water, but then the Holy Spirit was given to them as a gift go forward with just a couple of chapters to Acts chapter 10, um, where Peter is speaking to Gentiles at the house of Cornelius, and it says, while Peter was speaking, he's speaking about Jesus, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. Ha! That sounds good. And the circumcised believers who come with Peter, the Jewish, they were astonished 
that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being immersed in water. They received the Holy Spirit just as we have, so he ordered that they be immersed in the name of Jesus Christ. So in their experience, the Holy Spirit came upon them first, and then there was a need to get on with, uh, and freedom to get on with, uh, immersing them in water. So both things matter. Both are naturally part of the process of becoming a Christian. Then we hear an echo of that in what Jesus says when he describes to Nicodemus what it is to be born again. It's there in John chapter 3. He says you need to be born again of the water. You need to be born of water and spirit. There's an expectation of both of these things happening. So that's just a little rehearsal of things that I'm sure many of you would just be very familiar with. The question I want to move on to really is what are we to make of all of this? Like, so what <laughs> for us today? Speaking to a group of whom I imagine the great majority have been immersed in water and you have experienced the Holy Spirit. So, so what? Is, what is the significance of this for us today? Well, I think it would be helpful for us to look at another immersion in water, and that is Jesus' own experience with John the Immerser in the River Jordan. I want to read um, the stories there in all four Gospels. I just want to read from Luke's Gospel, and I'm going to jump over one or two. There's a genealogy, and there's a bit about the temptation of the wilderness. I'm just going to read from Luke chapter 3, and then from Luke chapter 4. So Luke chapter 3, and verse 21 says, at least it does when I've upgraded the translation, uh, when all the people were being immersed, Jesus was immersed too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. And then later in uh, Luke chapter 4, it starts saying, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. And it goes on to say how Jesus overcame all of those tests. Oh, I've gone a little way on. There we go. Jesus overcame all of those tests and remained clean and remained holy. And then it says in verse 14, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him and he went to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom and he stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him and unrolling it he found the place where it's written, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And he sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled. So from Jesus' own example to us, of his being immersed in water and it being a moment when the Holy Spirit came and rested upon him, those two things right there together. So to draw out three things that we see in this whole topic of being immersed in water and in the Spirit. And I want to focus uh, on what the Spirit does. The first thing is to note is that the Spirit cleanses us. The Spirit comes to cleanse us. Now Jesus didn't need cleansing. <laughs> He's already perfect, already entirely pure. Uh, but he did wait for this moment to be filled with the Holy Spirit before heading out into the desert for those extreme tests in which his, clean his cleanness and his holiness was proven in the fire of testing. Unlike Jesus, we do need cleansing. 
right? <laughs> and unlike Jesus, we do need transforming into greater purity and to greater holiness. And the truth is that the Holy Spirit loves to come and help us with just that. He loves to come and to wash us. Jesus described as he talked ahead of his death to his disciples about the, the other helper who would come, who was the Holy Spirit. He said, this Spirit, he's going he's to help you. He's going to help you by convicting you of your sin. Which, you know, we might have a bit of a, mm, I'm not sure I really want that. But, given that there is still the sinful habits of what we do with our bodies, how we think with our minds, sin, desires and yearnings for things that are just not good, it's all still in us. What a blessing to have that brought to the light. So much better for it to be brought to the light so that we can say, oh, yet yeah, that is in me, that we might repent of it, that we might turn away from it, and that we might change such a blessing to have that kind of, uh, whatever's wrong in us brought to, the, brought to light. I think I first was faced up with this at the age of about 19, some of you would have heard me mention this before probably, but I was leading a Christian union uh, in, in Oxford University, and in that Christian union there were a bunch of uh, very strongly reformed uh, Northern Irish uh, students who what reformed meant for them was a whole kind of church tradition, which included the fact that it was sinful to sing any songs other than the Psalms. And so when we gathered as a bunch of Christians from different church backgrounds and we sang songs like we sung this morning, they refused to be present until the singing was over and then they'd come in order that they might not be polluted by our participation in our ungodliness. So the relationship that I had with them was a little bit tense. And they did feel it was important in fulfilling all of their righteousness to point out to me what I was doing wrong. Um, and I remember being uh, complaining about that to, uh, to Steve Thomas, who, who many of you will know. And he said, I don't know what you're complaining about. I thought, I think you do. <laughs> it's pretty obvious. But anyway, he said, so this is just a blessing, right? There are two possibilities. When they come and tell you what you're doing wrong, there are two possibilities. One is that they're they're wrong in what they're saying, but since you're meant to be leading them, them coming and telling you all about it exposes their hearts, brings them into the light, and that's only helpful for you as a leader. Or, they're right. In which case, what a blessing, because the sooner someone comes and tells you what there is to change and upgrade, the better, surely. And um, it's one of those moments of recognising truth and not liking it. But um, I think by the grace of God, I've learned over the years to take that, to take that stance and to say, it's just such a help when whatever's wrong in us is named and brought to the light. Such a help. And if we care about morality, if we care about living well, then that will be our attitude. As um, I have a friend in, uh, who uses the word friend in this context and says, feedback is my friend. He, he's, the, he's the head of a primary school. He says, feedback is my friend. He teaches that to everyone. If you're going to, you can never be being in a school and just telling the children what they need to learn and as an adult be unwilling to learn. Feedback, the sooner you tell me what it is I need to change, the better. I think the Holy Spirit loves that atmosphere believe he does, in the school that, where it's been established, but in our lives, because the Holy Spirit cleanses. He comes to convict us of sin. Jesus also says the Holy Spirit comes to lead us into all truth. He also says that in John 16. It's a wonderful thing that the Holy Spirit does. And then when we walk in step with the Holy Spirit, as it describes in Galatians 5, there's all of this fruit that comes love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The Holy Spirit grows all of these things in us and it's a wonderful, wonderful thing that he does. Uh, secondly, that we see in Jesus' story, and it's true for us, that the Spirit 
makes God's love known to us. So in the story of Jesus being immersed in the River Jordan, we read that these words come from heaven. This is my beloved son. This is my son whom I love. And I'm well pleased with him. Actually, the picture of the Holy Spirit coming as a dove also speaks of the love of God. I don't know what you've thought or heard said about what's distinctive about doves. I think over the years I've heard people say doves are kind of especially timid birds and they're easily scared. Actually, doves are in the same family as pigeons, which are not known for being especially scared. And it's not true that doves are especially scared as birds. What is distinctive about doves, and it was very much understood in the ancient world, is that they speak of love and beauty. So we can see that in the Song of Songs, for example, just to quote a few bits about doves. In the Song of Songs in the Old Testament, how beautiful you are, my darling, how beautiful your eyes are doves. Doesn't mean they're running away. It means they're desirable and wanted and beautiful. Flowers appear on the earth. The season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard in our land. It's a picture of, of tenderness and of intimacy. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my flawless one. It says, my dove, my perfect one is unique, the only daughter of her mother, the favourite of the one who bore her. Dove speaks of intimacy and tenderness of beauty and of love. And God is love, and the Holy Spirit, being God, is love. Now, the Father loves Jesus, and Jesus loves the Father, and Jesus loves the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit loves Jesus, and the Father loves the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit loves the Father. The, the, the one in whose name Jesus said people should be immersed, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is this endless, dynamic, intimate love to one another. God is love. It's wrapped up in the very nature of who he is. He is a perfect, eternal union of love. And amazingly, we are invited in. It's, we are invited to come within the love of God. We are invited to be in Christ and to be immersed in the Holy Spirit and to become part of that relationship of love, to come within the love of God. And God does this, he makes it real to us in our experience through the Holy Spirit. So Paul, writing to the Roman church, wrote in Romans 5, or 8, I'll come to that in a moment, Romans 5 and verse 5, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. And in Romans 8 and from verse 15, it says that the spirit you received brought about your adoption as children of God, and by him, and by the spirit, we cry, Abba, which means Father. And the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So the Holy Spirit communicates to us, leaves us well assured that God loves us, gives us that experience of God's love. I, like you, I'm sh I trust you've had moments <laughs> when you've just been overwhelmed by an awareness of not just that God's here, not just his presence, not just the weight of his presence, but the warmth of his love. Sometimes people describe that as being like waves of liquid love struggling to find words for the intensity and the depth of the experience of the Holy Spirit. Being immersed in the Holy Spirit is an experience of being immersed in, 
in the most astonishing love. And we just see a little glimpse of that in the story of Jesus' own moment at the Jordan. Father God speaks, this is my son whom I love. And the Holy Spirit comes down like a dove. And then lastly, for us this morning at least, uh, the Holy Spirit empowers. So we see that in Jesus' story, don't we? The Spirit actually empowers him, leads him out into the wilderness, and there, with the Holy Spirit, he resists the temptations that come from the devil. And then he goes to the synagogue in Nazareth and says, this scripture's fulfilled, I'm full of the Spirit. He comes in the power of the Spirit, full of the Spirit, and proclaims freedom and healing. And Jesus himself said, that the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 1, that the disciples should wait in Jerusalem, I've read a bit of it already from Acts chapter 1, because they will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They'll be immersed in the Holy Spirit, and that will actually transform them and make them into witnesses. Now, I don't know about you, but um, I'm weary of powerless Christianity really, really fed up and weary of turning the handle of the Christian things we do when I don't see this transforming power of miracles of healing and of people being born again and of, we sung about society changing. I'm, I'm fed up, I'm bored of that kind of Christianity. You know, like you, I, I trust. I've had my moments of experiencing God's power. I remember one particular occasion being at a retreat place near Henley and God just giving me a simple prophetic word for a guy I didn't know. And I said, this picture that I see is that um, I see a cupboard that's been emptied bare of everything that's in it. And God says he wants to replenish your cupboard. It turned out that this guy, and the guy, he just, he, he screamed, which I wasn't expecting, and collapsed into a chair and just started sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. So I thought, oh, that's, I've probably got that one right. <laughs> or very wrong, I think, to discover. It turned out that he was an Anglican vicar who had recently lost his job and his wife and his home and access to his kids. And what was just delightful about that little moment was the Holy Spirit came and again communicated to him, I love you. I don't know what he'd done wrong or if he'd done other people done things wrong to him, I don't know. But what he rediscovered in that moment by the grace of God was I'm glad to have moments of that kind in my own life story and to have seen it and to have received it as well as God's used other people. But it's not enough to have the old story because, like you, I have family members and neighbours who are grieving whatever it is they've lost. Their health, their sanity, I don't know what people have lost. But they need to know that God loves them. They need to know that God loves them. And I don't have either the wisdom or the courage to get them to understand. That's the truth of it. I wish I did. The Holy Spirit is sent to help. The Holy Spirit is sent to empower us. We can receive him, we can be filled with him, we can be immersed in him, saturated, and then there's the necessary creativity. It just comes. And he is creator God, and the first instance of the Holy Spirit coming upon someone in the scriptures is in the book of Exodus, where he comes upon someone, two guys, to be craftspeople. Creative gifts come. 
There are all the spiritual gifts that are listed in 1 Corinthians 12, aren't there? Words of wisdom and knowledge and faith and healing and prophecy and miracles and discerning spirits and tongues and interpreting tongues. And it's not meant to be a complete list. There's so much more. In the book of Acts, we read how the Holy Spirit came upon the believers and emboldened them where they were frightened. I don't know about what you see, but as I look at my own life, and as I look at the church in the UK, we're a pretty timid bunch, with a few exceptions. We are a pretty timid bunch. Worried about what someone might say about us. <laughs> um, we need the Holy Spirit. So I have a simple question, really, for all of us, which is, uh, there's, a, there's a kind of an immediate right answer to this, but I want to encourage you to just look beyond the immediate right answer and to, uh, to search your heart, really, as I have asked, do you want to be immersed in the Holy Spirit? Do you want to be immersed in the Holy Spirit? And I want to finish with a little discovery that I've recently made in the book of Genesis, which is all about our hearts. Uh, in the NIV translation, it says in Genesis 3, in verse 8, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. If you have a new living translation, which some of you might use, it, instead of the cool of the day, it says, when the cool evening breezes were blowing. What it actually says in the Hebrew is that, and this is why people have tried to make it sound better English, God was walking in the garden in the wind of the day. That's what it actually says. God was walking in the garden in the wind of the day. And some of you will know that there's a word in Hebrew which is ruach, which is translated both to mean wind and also translated to mean spirit. So we have two different words in English for wind and spirit, but actually neither the Greeks nor the Hebrews do. They make one word suffice for both things. So there's a picture here of the ruach, the wind, the spirit coming, the ruach of the day <laughs> comes, God's walking in the Ruach of the day. And Adam and Eve hid. And I wonder how often when we sense God might be moving, we actually take a bit of a step back from what is a little nudge from the Lord maybe to share a word with someone or to go to a certain place. Well, there's a, we sense that God's calling us to deepen our times of intercession or of worship. In whatever it is where we sense that the Ruach, today's Ruach is, what is it today? If you're anything like me, quite often in those moments, you either let it pass by, or you just take it over, actually I'm a little bit busy today, Lord. I don't think you understand, I've still got more emails to answer, or I've still got tea to make or what, you know, whatever it is. And before we know it, we're hidden among the trees of the garden and, and the moment's passed by. So I want to ask again, do we want, do you want to be immersed in the spirit? And often at moments like this when we gather, we have a time of response, we can lay hands on each other to be filled with the spirit. I actually felt this morning no, we can all, if anyone needs prayer, we'll pray. Of course we will. But actually, what I really wanted to do, if I was right to do out of this, was to, to leave you with that question and, and to send you away, if anything, slightly troubled by it. And I, I know we're supposed to come together and find God's peace, but I felt like there was something here to, to stir up and to ask, how much do we want more of this? But how fed up are you of powerless Christianity? Jesus said, if we ask, then we'll find. So if we seek, then we'll find. 
And if we ask, it will be given to us. If you never received the Holy Spirit, if that's you this morning, if you've never received the Holy Spirit, if you're not sure if you have, ask someone to lay hands on you, like it was described in the book of Acts, lay hands on you to receive the Holy Spirit today. But if you are, you know that the Spirit lives in you, I want us to just stoke that desire, stoke that appetite and say, let's, let's be earnest in saying, I don't want to keep turning the handle. I don't want another month, I don't want another year of turning the handle. I want you, Lord. And so I'll finish there.
even if you can't see them as clearly as you used to be able to. Um, and I, I felt him saying that isn't a negative thing, it's a positive thing, because it's a reminder of how I've healed you. And it reminded me too then of how Jesus, he bears the scars on his hands. When he reappeared to the disciples in the upper room after he'd been crucified, he had the scars in his hand and hands. And um, that was a reminder of what he'd been through. And often when we see pictures of uh, how people think Jesus looks, um, he's often got the scars in his hands as a reminder of what he's done for us. So, um, I don't know any more than that, just that Jesus was saying that the scars were a reminder of what he's done for us. So I'll just leave that with you. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to take some time to pray before we go. Actually, we'll take a few minutes just to wrestle with those questions from Steve. Um, ask the Spirit for more. He says he will ask and you will receive. Um, if you'd like someone to pray for you, why don't you, there's space at the back over there and there's plenty of people who would love to pray for you, whether that's for the Spirit for the first time or for something that's coming out of the prophetic.
that brings us to our sort of formal end, but we do have time and space if you want to sit and pray for longer. Um, if you have kids, please do go and get them. Um, and also, let's be thinking about uh, the missional Sundays on the 27th of March. Um, be thinking about who you can invite. We're doing brunch here in Banbury and then after the team.